So Pretty Cure was always a series that I had an interest in to some degree or another after I found out about it, but it was never one that I got around to watching at all. I mean, that makes sense. It's a lot of stuff to get into, isn't it? Ask someone where to start and you'll get five different answers from five different people. It's not a series that's confusing, but it is one that has a long history behind it and a lot of content if you want to explore the whole thing. I'm a lover of magical girls and it was intimidating to me. And I've read One Piece. Twice. But not long ago, I decided I wanted to change that. I wanted to consume Precure to the best extent that I could. Mostly because Delicious Party Precure was in the middle of airing and I wanted to watch that. However, every time I got close to pressing play on the first episode, something held me back. Eventually, I realized what it was. It was stupid, really. Precure is a franchise that you don't really need to have watched everything. Hell, it's designed so that there can be a new series every year for little girls. But part of me wanted the history. It felt wrong to jump in at season 19, even if I logically could without much lost. So I didn't. I told myself I was going to have to watch everything in order, even if it killed me. But I wanted to bring others along on the journey with me, so that's what we're doing here and now. I finished Futari Wa Pretty Cure, and I want to talk about it, about what I liked, what I didn't, and what it was like to watch this series 18 years after it first aired. Futari Wa Pretty Cure first premiered in 2004, and yeah, all this time later, that does somewhat show. Not only in the fact that it's still in 3x4 ratio, but also in the design sensibilities. It's a very early 2000s anime. It's definitely got some of that lingering influence from the 90s, but the influence of the early 2000s is taking over as well, softening up some of the sharper lines that were distinctive of the 90s style, along with thinner outlines. It holds up really well, though. I like this look, and the animators really put their all into certain scenes. There's a lot of reuse of stock animation, but that's just kind of par for the course for a Magical Girl series, especially one of this era. However, I won't deny that with 49 episodes, things do end up getting pretty repetitive, but we'll get into that a little bit more later. For now, let's take a look at the characters that we have to work with here. We've got two main girls serving as our magical duo. Hanukkah and Nagisa. Now, they do very much share the spotlight and the protagonist role, but I think it would be foolish of us to deny that Nagisa is the one that's got a little bit more going on in her life, and she seems to get a little more of the focus when it comes to growing as a character. That's not to say Honoka doesn't get anything, but if you compare the number of side characters that are in the orbit and ongoing plot lines that each of them have, the lion's share went to Nagisa. So let's look at her first. Nagisa is, if we're going to give her a shorthand, the dumb jock. Now, she's not stupid, but she does struggle more academically of the two. However, it's never done in a she's going to flunk out sort of a way, but more is just a charming little flaw that she needs to work on. It's that sort of lovably dumb rather than actually dumb, if that makes sense. She's also involved in lacrosse, and a lot of her storylines revolve around her relationship with her teammates and the blocks that come up as a result of the natural drama of sports. Personally, I like that she's got a bit of a different sport going on than we typically see given to female characters in media. It's an off-the-wall choice, and I like that. I think I could count on one hand the number of TV shows, movies, and other such media that I have seen a female character as a lacrosse player in. Or maybe lacrosse teams for schools are just more common in Japan than they are where I live, I can't say for sure. Nikisa also has an active family life at home as well, with both parents and a younger brother. Granted, her parents don't exactly do much aside from a small handful of episodes where they give her advice or there are comedic moments where she needs to hide her mascot character from being spotted by them. Of our two leads, she's the one that has a romantic subplot, though it can be hard to call it that. It's more that she has a guy she's pining after, and that's about it. This is one of the things that there is little to no progress on over the course of the season, existing more as part of her world and the status quo, rather than something to be resolved at any point, as frustrating as that is. Overall, I think of our two leads, Nagisa is the more fun character, if only because the series allows her to be. It often plays up her over-the-top reactions to things and allows her to be more brash and bold, which leads to dynamic scenes and comedic moments that place her as more of a focus point. 
Her flaws that she needs to work on are also highlighted more within the story, giving us a chance to see some level of growth from her. Hanukkah, on the other hand, is a woman in STEM and has comparatively less going on. Part of this comes from the fact that she's definitely written to be the more reserved character, the straight man to the over-the-top reactions of Nagisa. There's nothing wrong with that, but it means she's less likely to steal a scene and stand out. Her moments that she has tend to be quieter ones and more introspective. While she has flaws, they're not quite as overt as Nagisa's and they get far, far less focus, leading to a feeling that she's not really growing as much as a character. Most of the time when she says something, she's right after all, which leads to her being more interesting for the growth that she facilitates in others than the growth that she goes through herself. She has less of a stable of side characters that she interacts with on a regular basis than Nagisa though. For her family, she only has her grandmother since her parents regularly work abroad. They do come around a bit, but it's in one-off occurrences. They never feel like a consistent presence in her life. She's also not part of a sports team, but rather involved in the science club because, like I said, she's a woman in STEM. The science club is a smaller group, though, and consists more of characters that are just there to fill out shots, as only a few of them ever get any focus in any episodes. There's also just overall fewer episodes spent with the science club, but I suspect that's because it's easier to create conflict around a sporting match than with a club setting. Hanukkah ends up coming to a lot of Nagisa's games, but she doesn't have any real interactions with the girls of the lacrosse team when she does, so it's not like they're a shared pool of characters for the two to both interact with, except in a few more school-focused settings. To be fair though, early in the series, a lot of focus is put on the fact that Honoka and Nagisa just run in completely different social circles whenever they're not in the classroom together. If it weren't for the fact that they were being magical girls together, then they likely wouldn't have formed as close of a bond as they do over the course of the series. Honestly, in a genre that can so often fall back on the power of friendship above all else, it's nice to see one acknowledge that these girls don't really have a reason to be friends at first. However, that also doesn't mean that their bond can't be an incredibly deep one as both of them bring out the best in each other. There's also a handful of mascot characters and I hate them. Well, that's a strong way to put it, but they are really, really annoying. Mepple is the worst at first since Mipple isn't quite as whiny as Mepple can be. They're both annoying, but it's made worse by the fact that Mepple is whiny and demanding so much more often than Mipple is. For a good portion of the series, these two are problem causers, not seeming to understand the concept of there being a time and place for them to speak up. Whenever I think of Mepple, I'm drawn back to the scene where he makes a ton of noise in class just because he's hungry, nearly exposing himself to everyone there in the process. However, we have to have them around at all times because they live in and transform into the transformation item for Hanukkah and Nagisa. These two just straight up can't do anything magical without the both of these mascots around. These two do at least become a little more tolerable in the back half of the season, mostly because they get put in charge of a child. Polun comes in at the halfway point and he's even less tolerable than the other two. He's whinier and even more demanding because he's a literal child and a spoiled one at that. He feels like every trope for a poorly written little sibling character rolled into one and I just wanted him gone the entire time. There's like one or two points where he's alright, but other than that, ugh. There's a handful of other little magical fairy type characters that live in the magical world they're trying to protect, the Garden of Light. They're mostly to serve a purpose, but they do that well enough. They have a little personality, but not enough that they're going to be standing out in my mind long term. What I remember most is the old one not being able to remember what the girls are called, and the one that holds on to the MacGuffin stones being surprisingly snarky for a character of that sort. Then we have the queen, and she's just a queen, and that's it. The most notable thing about her is the weird use of CGI they did, and she's entirely made of it, yet never moves at all, which is a bit of a choice. But given the era this came out in, I can't say I'm at all shocked. Other incidental side characters include all of the kids in Nagisa and Honoka's class, who may get promoted to side characters for the episode here and there, but otherwise blend into one big indistinct group together. The girls of the lacrosse team are much the same way, a big group that we can pull a character or two out of now and then, but otherwise are just a massive, generic, friendly girls. 
you have each of the girls' families, notable really only as characters that it's a little harder to keep secrets from. Of these, the one that stands out in my memory at all is Honoka's grandma, partly because she functions as a minor mentor character at times, and partly because she tells that story about the tree on the hill a whole bunch and the repetition just stuck in my memory. The side characters aren't overall the strongest part of the series, but all of them are really pleasant enough. The only ones that aren't are, well, the villains. So, um, villains. Right. We have two sets of them for two different sagas in the series. In the first saga, we have the characters from the Dark Zone, and that means we have, uh, this guy? And this guy. And him? Okay, yes, I am clearly being pretty unfair here. However, the problem stands that the vast majority of the villains in both halves of the season are just not interesting in the slightest. I joked about this guy, but funnily enough, he is one of the two that I actually remember the name of because his name is Pissard. Pissard. Like, that's actually his name and that's absolutely buck wild. The other one that stands out in my memory is this guy. This is Kyria, the youngest looking of the group of five characters that make up the villains for the first portion of the series. He is, however, the blandest looking one. He stands out in one way, though. He functions differently than the other villains in this section of the story. You see, for most of Futari wa Pretty Cure, the villains won't do all that much different. They'll show up, have a tiny bit of banter, summon a monster of the week, and then engage in a fight with our heroes. Kyria, on the other hand, for just a little bit, has a different approach that shakes up the formula enough to make him memorable. He integrates into life at Honoka and Nagisa's school, joining their class in an attempt to either get close to them or monitor them for any sign of weakness or an opportunity to sabotage. He also starts forming a kind of bond with Honoka, but despite the emphasis the show tries to put on it, it's not anything that ever feels fully developed. You see, the show has a bit of a strange deal where it feels like it's divided into two halves, and that's because it kind of is. The team on this one basically told one story in the first half and another in the second. Connected to each other, sure, but two complete adventures. If the first story were lengthened to fill the entire season, I think the whole Kyria plot could have been a lot stronger. However, the fact that the episodes to tell the story in were limited and he was introduced fairly late in the game means you don't really have time to get attached to him. We see him a few times before he becomes plot relevant, but he's really only the focus for a handful of episodes. You see, Kyria starts developing feelings and becoming a little more human over more time he spends at school. Surprise, surprise, in a show that involves the power of friendship being turned into lasers, we're gonna make friends with someone along the way. However, when he does decide to turn his back on the way of evil and hand over his magic MacGuffin stone to Honoka and Nagisa, he gets nabbed and taken away. That happens in episode 21. While he would be mentioned a sparse handful of times, and Hanukkah, the one who is clearly much closer to him, is sad for an episode or two, it's not really an event that feels like it has a long-term impact on the show. He very briefly shows up again over 20 episodes later as like a spirit warning before vanishing again, until the final episode where he helps out in the final battle before vanishing completely into the ether. It's implied that he's basically reincarnated as a human, but it's not something that comes up again after that point. The second half of the series brings us a whole new set of villains as well, but they function just about the same. Despite being a little more eccentric than the others that came before, it's not enough to make them memorable in any way, and there's not anything interesting about them besides the fact that they each have a plain human form to walk around in now. There's also these two added to the show, a pair of servants slash housekeepers, that we have to assume split off from the main monster of the week generating monster, Zakina. So since we're on the topic of villains, let's talk about the fights. In general, there's one per episode, the exception being the few times where a conflict spills over more than one episode, which would be when each of the story arcs wraps up, generally. One thing that is definitely of note is the way that these girls are doing more hand-to-hand -hand combat than we typically see of the genre. It's not something that's completely unheard of, of course, but most magical girls are more content with their heroines slinging around magic blasts to avoid accusations of being a violent show. There's also the added benefit that these magic attacks generally come with some sort of stock animation. 
which can be used to eat up episode time along with the transformation sequence each episode. It's totally something that's just the nature of the beast. So to see a magical girl not only give the girls hand-to-hand -hand combat experience, but animate it stunningly well at times, well, that's just great. That's not to say that the girls don't have their share of repetitive moments and stock animation, though, and that repetition is something that really grinds on you when you're watching through the whole show. With a few rare exceptions, every single fight will be ended with the same big stock magic attack blast. All of them. There are a few scant times where the blast doesn't work, but in a fair few of those, doing it again but with more friendship is generally what ends up blowing the enemy away. Once again, I am aware that this is the nature of the genre, but that doesn't stop it from feeling repetitive nonetheless. It's especially evident when you get to episodes where whatever the weekly villain is shows up very late in the episode, so it can feel like there's less than 30 seconds of a fight before the big laser blast happens. The variation comes in with those combat moments, and when those are shorter, the fights end up being more boring. It gets even worse in the back half of the series, too, when Polun gets introduced. You see, while Meppel and Mipple act as the keys to transforming, Polun ends up being a kind of generator of a power-up. When this happens, Pretty Cure gains bracelets that we'll talk more about later, which act as a general power-up but allows them to do a more powerful version of the usual magic blast, which is now needed to dispatch the presumably stronger enemies. This is all well and good, and it's clear that the reason they don't transform with them immediately on is so that Polun can continue to have plot relevance, but what this ends up doing is bogging down the fights. Polin doesn't seem to really have full control of his ability to give out a power-up. It's something that seems to manifest out of a strong desire to help Hanuka and Nagisa or from general emotional turmoil. The distance he can do it at seems to be pretty lengthy as long as he knows where the pair is as well, since we see him at one point send it to the school rooftop while being on the ground floor. The problem with this lack of control is that with Polun as part of the equation and the almighty giver of power-ups, fights become a game of fighting until Polun gets upset enough to trigger his powers. It's not an altogether bad idea, but I think it's something that could have been made stronger by Polun having some sort of an arc over a couple episodes about learning to control his powers and making his choice to give the power-up to the girls a more active one. Polun also has this bad habit of getting grabbed up a lot and held hostage which ends up facilitating the problem more and gives him more moments to whine and cry, which is when he is at his most annoying. Grabbing him became such a common conflict that I eventually did write down in my notes, what is this, the Protect Polun Power Hour? The only other issue with the fights is that their connection to the overall story can be flimsy at best. There are a few times where the main conflict of the episode will tie into the combat portion of it, of course, for example, there's a point where Honoka and Nagisa end up having a big fight and aren't really in sync with one another when the villain comes around. This leads to them struggling in the fight and then resolving their issues as a result of that. Both parts tie into one another. However, there are other times where the fight is just interrupting their daily lives. Like the combat gets in the way of the slice of life section for a bit before going away. Now, I don't expect every episode to have some kind of a connection like this, especially not this early on when Precure is still finding its vibe. However, it is something that I hope to see more of in the future of the series. Now, let's talk about those magic items that get used in the show. It's no secret that a good chunk of the point of Pretty Cure is to be a marketing vehicle of sorts. There's a new season every year, so every year there are new toys for little girls to clamor for and for adult collectors to try and collect up along with the more specialty items like figures. My concern is just how well these items are incorporated into the main content of the series. I know that I'm being marketed to since I'm an adult with a big adult brain, but my hope is that it's not always super clear that I'm being marketed to. Even if they are there for marketing purposes, I still want them to somewhat naturally blend into the story. So what do we have here? First up is the Card Commune. Yeah, I had to look up the name for this one to put it in my notes. That's what it's specifically called, but let's be real. It's the transformation item, and that's how you're going to remember what it is. We actually see a lot of these since Meppel and Mipple aren't able to permanently maintain their real form on Earth, apparently, though that does seem to become less of a consideration the longer the show goes on, I noticed. Either way, these are pretty obviously cell phone shaped, and I bought that as being a good way to hide them. It's something that you would expect girls of that age to maybe have in 2004, 
Like, not unheard of, but definitely something of a luxury. I think it makes sense to make it a phone because that's something that feels grown up to little girls. My only qualm is that the girls never are able to use them like a communicator, which I think was a missed opportunity. However, it's pretty obvious that the reason that it's like this is that they are clearly meant to be something more of a Tamagotchi instead. Even before I looked up the toy to see that it was in fact a Tamagotchi type thing in some manner, it was obvious from the way that cards needed to be swiped in order to attend to the needs of the mascots. This was the point where it felt a little too much like I was being marketed to, and I knew from the jump that there had to be some kind of collect-them-all card-collecting thing to the merch. Seems I was right. There were cards that came with the toys, cards that came with candy, and four series of cards that came in packs bought separately, all of which interfaced with the toys in some way. It's so blatant. However, they also may have been some kind of nostalgia thing as well, since there was a reissue of some of them for the 15th anniversary, it looks like. Then there was the Hoppish, which acted like a sort of MacGuffin holder for the heart-shaped stones that need to be gathered up in the first arc of the season, and then sort of protected from then on. We see this often enough for it to be relevant, though it is a little lackluster that it just doesn't exist until they need to put a stone in. However, the fact that it's something that they need to go out and hunt down does lead to a proactive moment from the girls, which was greatly appreciated. It's certainly there to sell toys to play pretty cure with your friends, but it's unobtrusive enough. Next up was the diaries. This was introduced as a sort of reward for finding the Hopish and putting stones into it for the first time, which I think was a fine way to bring them into play. They came up a few times, but generally weren't obtrusive and at least served some point in the narrative when they did, even if part of me did wish that they were utilized more and had more function than only you can read it. The Prism Love Checker was the one that got on my nerves the most in terms of being something that is so obviously there to move merch. The second it shows up, it looks so much like a plastic toy, it's unbelievable, and it behaves like one too. It comes up like only two times in the whole series, so it's not around a lot, but it's so blatant and absolutely useless. Then the last thing that we have is the Rainbow Bracelet, which is another one of those toys that you need to play Pretty Cure with your friends. This falls into the same realm as the transformation items in that it's used all the time and plot relevant as a general power-up. Personally, looking at the merch photos that I was able to find, I appreciate that both this and the card commune had a function that you could swap the faceplates for it to be either Cure Black or Cure White's version, instead of trying to sell you two different ones because they're different colors. My only real qualms with this one in specific are that the design of the item in the show looks like a cheap piece of plastic. I don't know if the show design or the toy design came first, but either way, it was ugly to see on otherwise well-designed characters. Okay, so now that that's done, I just want to talk about some of the things over the course of the series that stood out to me. Uh, these aren't going to be connected, really, but just things I noticed that wouldn't fit into other places in my script. That first villain, Pissard, is really indicative of the series finding its feet because in the early episodes his power set was really inconsistent and he seemed to be able to just do whatever in order to accomplish the goals of the episode. Like in one episode he was able to do mind control and then the next he was able to turn people to stone, which I did kind of find funny. There is this stereotype of magical girl shows that by the power of friendship and having girls really be gal pals, they can come off as either intentionally or unintentionally pretty queer. I don't think that it was intentional here, but if someone wants to make an argument for Honoka and Nagisa being in love, I could totally buy it, even with how much they try and shove Nagisa having a crush on a boy in front of us. In fact, with how nowhere that goes over the course of the season, that is not the couple I end up rooting for. So, um, rock on, you funky little lesbians. They did show us early on that Nagisa is popular with the girls, and there is also the school play episode where we get a good old trope of gal pals having to play Romeo and Juliet. So I couldn't figure out where to fit this in when talking about the fights, but one of the primary things that makes these two stand out from a lot of other magical girls besides the hand-to-hand -hand combat is the fact that they need to hold hands with each other to transform. They not only need their little transformation items, but each other as well. So it really becomes a recurring plot point to separate them from each other, 
or the mascots in order to keep them from transforming. The second this was used for the first time, I got really worried that this was going to be a constant thing. But the usage was actually spaced out enough that it never felt too repetitive when it came up. However, it did lead to moments where the villain would just have their hands on one of the mascots and then just give them back for no reason, which felt pretty odd. Episode 42 was just my straight up favorite for the entire show, hands down. There had been some moments of really expressive animation before, but this episode had it in spades and really brought it to a head. It had the plot point of the girls being separated, but it was used much more deliberately, which felt like an evolution of the formulaic uses that came before. It's also an episode that really makes you feel and believe the bond between these two girls. I'm not entirely sure that it can be watched without some level of context, but it is definitely well worth the watch. The final stretch of episodes really bring home how much the slice of life elements of the series are important, even if they don't always connect up perfectly with the magical battle portions. When slice of life is completely gone, you end up feeling the absence and it's so clear that these girls just want things to be concluded so they can be sure that everyone they love is safe. It's really sweet, though it is a shame that in the end a lot of the finale comes down to Polin, the worst character. Overall, I had a good time with the show, but I don't think it's the greatest thing in the world. It's very middle of the road for me, if that makes sense but it's so clear that this laid the groundwork to be a solid foundation for the series as a whole to build on a launching platform of sorts. It is odd to me that they would make a sequel season since so much of the second half of this show felt like a victory lap sort of story that another season would just feel like another victory lap, but what can you do? It's not like they knew at the time that this was going to spin out into a meta series or anything like that. At the time, it was just Honoka and Nagisa, and I think for this show, that was enough. 